Hello and welcome to this Bristol Festival of Ideas event um, where um, I'm Sarah Dighton and I'm in conversation with the author Jonathan Lee. Um, it's the author of four novels. He's also editorial director at Bloomsbury and was previously at the very fine independent publisher Catapult. But today we're going to be talking about his fourth novel called The Great Mistake. Um, this tells the story of the actual historical figure, Andrew Haswell Green, who's now been largely forgotten, but who in his time was known as the father of greater New York um, and is a remarkably interesting person who has been brought to extraordinarily vivid life by Jonathan in his novel. Um, so Jonathan, if I could start by asking you um, maybe to talk a little bit about the historical Andrew Haswell Green. Who was he and why is he such an interesting person? Yeah, he's, thank you. He, he's, he is very interesting. Um, you know, the, the great mistake, my, my novel about him, about this 19th century civic leader who ended up being murdered on Park Avenue at the age of 83 after sort of creating modern New York, started when I was walking around Central Park one day about nine years ago and I just came across this bench in a seldom visited part of the park that that had a, um, a, mem a memorial inscription on it and called him Andrew Haswell Green the father of greater New York as you say and creating genius of Central Park and I just got really curious about who he was and when I started to look into his life and also his kind of somewhat dramatic death on Park Avenue and discovered that he was this sort of 19th century civic leader without whom there would be no Central Park, perhaps no Metropolitan Museum of Art, no American Museum of Natural History, no Bronx Zoo, no preservation of the Hudson River Palisades. Um, he also uh, almost single-handedly sort of brought about the movement in New York to consolidate the existing city of New York, which was really just Manhattan in the 1800s, um, and merge it with, with Brooklyn and, and Staten Island and parts of Queens County. So that's how he became known as the father of greater New York. He, he literally made New York greater, bigger. And um, because one of the things that you, um bring very vividly to life in the novel is the fact that New York, prior to the consolidation and prior to um, the sort of great works that Andrew Haswell Green and other of his peers were involved in, it's quite a provisional place, quite a sketchy place, not really um, on a par with New York as we would imagine it or as it symbolises um, this sort of idea of a great metropolis today. It's a messy place when Green arrives it in your novel it's um quite squalid in some ways but also with lots of opportunity um could you maybe talk a bit about how you took yourself imaginatively back to that version of you in new york and how you managed to sort of supersede the one that actually exists in real life now yeah it's interesting because cities are sort of made up of these ghost versions of themselves that have existed at different times, aren't they? And I think with with New York, you know, I with the research for this novel, I sort of, because it spans a number of decades, I had to try and become some kind of expert for a minute or two in what New York was like in 1830, what it was like in 1840, what it was like, in, and, and it was changing so quickly. I mean, when Andrew Haswell Green arrived in, in New York, the entire city existed below 20th Street. You know, the site that would eventually become his site for creating Central Park was just wild lands. Um, and there was a African-American settlement called Seneca Village that was there that was sort of, it's very important to the history of New York. But basically it was an area that, um, that most people did, didn't, go to and there were wild animals running around and one of the thoughts behind starting to create zoos in New York was that there were so many wild animals just running around the streets. <laughs> so I, I found that, you know, to try and get away from the tyranny of hindsight a bit, I tried to, after a certain point in my research, to stop reading so much about what New York was like 
then by historians writing today and start to just immerse myself more in contemporaneous accounts. So like the New York Times archive, for example, is great. You could, if you're setting a scene on a specific day, you could read about the news from that day. And I kind of got in the habit of, of reading the newspapers backwards because I was interested in the smaller stories in the back rather than the headlines. And, you know, there are also things like Dickens's notes, American notes on his travels, you know, he was, he was there around this time and, and he's writing about the street pigs and the squalor and all the rest of it, but also the strange beauty and, and kind of honesty of, um, it's always been there with New York of just strangers lives colliding all the time and, and interacting in interesting ways. Are there any um, cities today that you thought of as being comparable to um, 19th century New York in this period? Are there any places that you that you sort of think of as having that kind of up and coming, um, energy is quite a lame word, but I suppose energy is what I mean, that feeling of people coming together and um, aspiration and possibility in the way that New York had it. Yeah, well, it's interesting. I mean, the, the setting is so different, but I, I lived in Tokyo for a little while. And I think there, there's there's probably some of the, the similar sense of both possibility and energy, but also just like suffocating crowdedness that was starting to become a, a sense uh, that people had in 19th century New York. So it's sort of the... the um, the super futuristic version, like Tokyo and Seoul and other places, I think, of the, the futuristic version in a way of that, those sensations that were maybe a lot starting to be alive in 19th century New York. I mean, you know, and Andrew Haswell Green was, he sort of believed that, um, you know, we live in a world where sometimes to our detriment we're obsessed with the individual over the collective, the private over the public interest, self selfishness over being selfless, the short term over the long term. And I think, you know, you, you may or may not think that those sentiments have been thriving recently with Trump and Boris Johnson and Putin and others. But in 19th century New York, he really sort of worked against those trends and he believed in public space and public health and supporting the arts and he foresaw too pretty early that polluting the environment often hits the poorest hardest and that your best first chance at a somewhat more equal society is to give people clean air and green spaces public spaces in which they can freely move and i you know i suppose in that sense um i don't know maybe maybe you need to look to some scandinavian cities and other places where that have been slightly more at the vanguard of that than um, than London and New York have been in the last ten or twenty years. Um, because it's a very um, an interesting um, kind of question that the novel brings up is how much can one individual man influence the course of history, and the um, the feeling that you get from the Great Mistake is both or certainly that I got from the great mistake is both that a city is a great work of many people and a huge collaborative act and also that one individual with a vision can have a hugely powerful influence in terms of directing what that collaborative activity is going to come towards um which I suppose brings us to the title of this event and the idea of city leaders. I mean, do you think, did Andrew Haswell Green see himself as a city leader, do you think? Did he identify with that kind of role and authority? I don't think he, I don't think he did see himself as a city leader. I think he sort of spent much of his life trying to avoid being seen as a politician and of course he, he wasn't um, an elected official he was really a, a city planner who leaned democratic but but sort of tried to stay out of some of the morass of sort of republicans versus democrats that was sort of forming at that time um, I think he sort of saw himself as a publicist in the oldest sense of the world that he was a 
a guy who was trying to do things for the public good and think long term about the future of New York and what could make it great. <laughs> and, you know, a word that Trump has <laughs> somewhat devalued since. But, you know, I think um, his story points to the fact that maybe, you know, one thing successful city leaders can do is, is build a build a team of people who might not be elected, who might be civil servants, who are thinking long term about what what our cities, what we want them to look like, what we, what we want them to feel like. And um, I sometimes think that the, you know, the political system right now isn't really geared up for that. The short term is thinking conquers everything and election cycles are in charge of policy. But, you know, that's that's another conversation, I guess. An interesting conversation, though, and I think um, another thing that the novel um, looks at quite interestingly are the tensions between um, democracy and the public good, which are not always completely aligned, certainly in some of when you some of the tensions that you're talking about there when you're talking about the long term benefits to the public versus what is in the short term electorally desirable those things don't always go together and um certainly your version of andrew Hiswell green is quite um he's interesting and ambiguous i think in the way that he feels about the public and the way that he um approaches acting well towards the public because he is at the same time that he is doing public good he's a very private man and is that true of the historical Andrew Haswell Green as well as your Andrew Haswell Green? Yeah, it is. I mean, he, he certainly agonised over not particularly wanting to be a public face of, of things, I think, of, of policy. I think that was one of the things that sort of turned him off from politics a little bit. Um, also, uh, you know, he I think he was quite solitary and in a sense, those, those things of being highly private while also doing public work. One of the ironies that attracted me to, to writing about him, but also make complete sense. I mean, for Andrew Haswell Green and for many others like him, a public space like Central Park was a way to, to be alone without feeling alone and to be in solitude while experience the, experiencing the comfort of other passing lives. And I think, you know, as someone who lives in New York, the city provides me with some sense of that too I mean that's also what writing and reading are for me they're ways to be alone without feeling alone and books great books like great cities can maybe at their best offer that feeling of being invisibly accompanied in your in your loneliest moments you know and and certainly while I was writing the book this idea of public space and being private in public space came to the forefront of my mind I I was right at the end of the book when the pandemic hit, but the pandemic, I think if we were to try and take away any positives has, has, has made us reassess the, the value of public spaces in our lives and in our cities, you know, parks have become reprieves from isolation, pubs and restaurants have spilled out onto pavements, schemes to reclaim city streets for pedestrians have flourished, like schools with open gates have become a source for celebration rather than complaint. So it's almost like it's taken this to put us into a new era of appreciation for public spaces like Central Park or, you know, the Downs in Bristol or whatever it might be as being like the sort of lungs of our cities and, and our lives, I think. And yeah, I think that's um, a brilliant point really well expressed and the analogy between um city living and reading a novel as well um is fascinating thank you for that um and part of the um the version of Andrew Haswell Green that you write is that he is someone who has a particular reason for pursuing privacy of a kind, a particular reason for wanting to leave behind his background and a particular aspect of his life. I don't want to, um, I will leave it up to you how much you want to kind of give away the story that you tell of him. Um, and who has a particular um, rift between him and his family that drives him towards the city. Um, 
And that idea of the city as a place where you can be um, solitary without being isolated is really interesting and really important to this novel and to this version of Haswell Green as well. Um, how do you feel as a novelist, how do you feel about um, building fiction in the cracks of a real person's life? How much do you think about that and what kind of um, sort of judgments and considerations did you put into creating your version of Andrew Haswell Green? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I think in the end, with any character, historical or otherwise, their inner life belongs only to them. So, you know, even if they're long dead, as is the case with Andrew Haswell Green, like a novel like mine is an act of trespass, you know, just as um, a TV show like The Crown is an act of trespass in some sense on the royal family or a deliciously odd historical movie like The Favourite, maybe an act of trespass on the ghost of Queen Anne. And I suppose, you know, I'm, I'm not comparing myself to Shakespeare, <laughs> but you, you look back at sort of every form of literature across the ages that sort of used real figures and, and invented around the edges and into the cracks. And it's, it's, um, it's something that's been happening since the start of time, really, you know. Um, I said my feeling with him was that, you know, when I got to access boxes of his diaries and letters at the New York, New York Historical Society that uh, no one, I could see no one had logged out for, for many, many years. I, I'd started to feel quite comfortable in his life and in his personality and who he he was. And things like his relationship with Samuel Tilden, which, you know, several people have sort of long rumoured to have been a homosexual relationship in some sense. I felt like I wanted to be quite careful to not label what that relationship was, what that love was, but to be true to to the, the love and the affection that I found in their correspondence with each other and in, in just this very clear sense that whether consummated or not and whether, whether just a really, really, really close friendship or something more, whatever your read of the materials is, they were the central emotional event of their lives, uh, of each other's lives. And you know, the great mistake in writing any novel or spending years writing about any historical figure is also kind of an act of love. You know, it's it's an effort to capture something of the soul of a person who died 119 years ago and maybe des deserves to be remembered. And, and I sort of hope that this book and, and other narratives like it might make us feel freer to imagine our own versions of some of those long gone figures because if we don't feel free to imagine ourselves into those gaps in the facts then then those those memories of those names do kind of die away I think. So um, essentially if we're not willing to take certain liberties with imagining past people's lives then they you know essentially cease to exist really don't they if you can't perform that um, you know, perform that theory of mind on them, even as long dead people, then you're not treating them as people, I suppose. <laughs> I mean, it's interesting. My, you know, my, my, my book is pretty clearly labeled as fiction. And, but I, I think the work of a biographer um, is similar, right? If you read like a, a biographer, a, a biography of another great city planner who is remembered in New York, um, Robert Moses, you know, who who certainly applied different ethical standards to his work than Andrew Haswell Green and was a bit more of a self-promoter and that's maybe partly why he was remembered. But he try and rebuild his life as Robert Caro did in his amazing biography of Robert Moses, The Power Broker. You can do all the research in the world, but you still have to kind of come to a point of view on someone, on who someone was and you still have to, to some extent, imagine yourself into the gaps in the historical record and um you know look you look at wolf hall or the biographies of cromwell they in the end there is no way to shy away from the fact that um 
your own subjectivity comes into play in some sense in the portrait that is created. I would definitely say one of the things that I um, ad admired greatly about The Great Mistake, which is an, a novel that I enjoyed hugely. Um, one of the things that I found um, especially impressive about it is that you both um, achieved treating Andrew Haswell Green as a convincing human person who, who felt pretty much entirely real to me, um, but without importing um, a sort of anachronistic 21st century sense of relationships or of ethics and morals, you were very, um, something very um, tactful and gracious about the way you have been able to um, produce him as a man in his time. I think. Um, was that a challenging thing to do? Did you spend a lot of time kind of reading other memoirs as well as immersing yourself in the history of New York? Because really you've um, created kind of an emotional history as well as a civic history. Yeah, I think, I mean, I th again, I think I, his diaries and letters were really useful in terms of trying to get some of that emotional texture. And then I suppose there was probably a point at which being an outsider to this story, you know, that there is no one who can write the autobiographical novel version of meeting Andrew Haswell Green in 19th century New York, because they're all dead. And so there's this sense in which when you're writing a historical novel, you're writing a kind of ghost story and you're, and you're on the outside looking in. And I tried to sort of bake that into the very texture of the novel in the in ways that I could, you know, instead of um, pretending that that outsiderness wasn't there. I mean, one small example would be, you'll notice in the first chapter that the newspaper accounts are italicized and there's a sense of sort of other narratives forming around what happened on the day of his murder when he was shot dead on Park Avenue in 1903. And those newspaper accounts can't even agree on what the weather was like in that moment. So I tried to, to, to give you up front a sense of um, the instability of the truth around those things and the ways in which our perspectives on these events are sort of partial and continually revised. And I also love that New York is a city made up of outsiders. You know, it's one of the special things about it. I mean, my favorite piece of New York literature is probably E.B. White's um, long essay here is New York and you know it divides New Yorkers up into three categories those who are born here those who commute here who are a growing group and and the settlers the the people who come from elsewhere from the outside but make New York City their full-time home and that's me I moved here from England 10 years ago and White says that the settlers give the city its passion because they're always looking at the texture of the city and its stories and trying to read the city in new ways because they're new to it. And I relate to that a bit because having spent many years before this in, in London, a friend would come and visit from Paris or Tokyo or wherever and ask me about all these buildings I passed every day and all these monuments and I would have no idea. My curiosity was sort of deadened by seeing all these things every day. But when you're, when you're somewhere new and you're, adrift it can be different I think and um, so you are I mean do you think of yourself as a New Yorker currently or do you think of yourself as a Londoner who happens to live in New York at the moment where would you place yourself I think I I think 10 years in and um having kids who are have American passports now and 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 sort of being a dual citizen I, I sort of think of myself as as a New Yorker, um, and and then I would sort of think of myself in some sense as being European too, a bit more generally than 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 feeling sort of like a Londoner abroad, I guess. It's really interesting, and um, interesting, I suppose, to have written, um, you know, essentially a love letter to New York from your perspective as a, you know, quote unquote, settler. 
of the city when you started it were you conscious of it i mean well certainly i i felt that it was a love letter to the city in some ways were you conscious of it as being that when you started doing it or or is it not that at all i don't i don't think i was conscious of that um and i don't you know i don't know whether it is or or it isn't it's probably not for me to say but um Certainly, I do feel a love for New York, and I'm sure that comes across in in the pages somewhat, uh, even while trying to show it in all its squalor and imperfections. <laughs> um, I think that when I started writing the book, you know, rather than thinking like, oh, I know New York and I want to write a love letter to it, I think I just felt a sort of itch, a curiosity to find out more about the history of the city that I was now living in. And I've, I've said this before, but I think that, you know, gr growing up as a writer, like if anyone was on hand to offer advice, it was often some version of write what you know. And for me, it's it, that's not ended up being that helpful. Uh, what's been more helpful is to write what I want to know about and that, that, that interest and curiosity will carry me through. And I think I, I wanted to know more about the history of the city I found myself in. And that's one of the reasons why when I discovered that park bench dedicated to Andrew Haswell Green, my my um, my eyes opened wide and I ended up going down this rabbit hole for nine years. And um, I'm just going to have to dwell slightly on the nine years thing because that's an impressive amount of time to spend working on a novel. So, I mean, Presumably, is that nine years from the germ of the idea through sort of following up your curiosity to completing the manuscript? Yeah, exactly. And I, I think, you know, it's something that um, readers and aspiring writers and understandably often want to know is like how long something took to write. And I remember like going to readings and stuff when I was when I was starting to write and asking the same question, because you sort of want to, <laughs> there's something fascinating about the timeframes and trying to quantify it. Um, and of course it's all completely useless really, because someone could say, oh, well, this thing took me two years and maybe they were just like working on it 12 hours a day for two years, or they could say it took me, in my case, you know, nine years, but I wrote most of another novel, High Dive also during that time and, um, had a couple kids and had a full-time job and you know did so um, but yeah it occupied my brain some element of my brain space for, for about nine years I think. Well you can absolutely tell from the depth of research and the attention of detail that this is a product of you know a long-standing and very profound interest um, in this character. Um, I mean, Andrew Haswell Green is, is such an interesting person. I mean, I came away from reading the novel and, you know, it was immediately looking up any resources that I could find. I wanted to know as much as I could about this um, person who'd had this extraordinary influence, who, um, you know, suffered this, uh, astonishing and um, dramatic death um, wanted to find everything that I possibly could and there's very very little about him he really has sort of slid you know up until your novel really has sort of slid out of historical consciousness quite profoundly do you have any theory I mean you've mentioned a couple of things that might explain it but do you have a kind of a grand unified theory of the obscurity of Andrew Haswell Green not really, except that, um, well, I suppose one point is that most people slide into obscurity. You know, it's, we're, we're living through an age now where if someone is interested in our conversation now in a hundred years, maybe, hopefully, then they will, they will be able to find out quite a bit probably about both of us because things exist. To, off off paper you know in in databases and in clouds and and so there will and there'll be like a you know two hundred thousand photographs that they can probably find <laughs> of us um that yeah it's a horrible thought but that you know that 
that was not obviously the case with the 19th century. So some of it's time. Some of it is just that 99.99999% of people have forgotten forever and disappear into the ether, even if they achieve quite a lot, whilst a few figureheads are elevated. So, you know, you can, you can surf around on Wikipedia and say like, who are the pe famous people who were born in 1901? And it will give you like a list of 50 people. And it's like, well, that's 50 people out of a, a few hundred million. And the rest are just, <laughs> they're just off the page. They're, they're, they're maybe not even in the footnotes of history. They're just in the white space around it, just sort of floating around. I think with Andrew Haswell Green specifically, he was not a huge self-promoter. I think he wanted to live on through his work, didn't spend a lot of time trying to make his reputation last by commissioning all sorts of fancy people to write fancy articles about him, you know, which was something that happened at the time with some others. I think there's also the fact, you know, he, he never had children. Um, he never married. He never, he didn't, he didn't leave behind a life partner or really close relatives. And there's a line towards the end of the book that my publicist always likes quoting, which is um, that, you know, in the end, what you need is love and a good publicist. And, <laughs> and I sort of meant publicist in the old sense of the world, like someone doing pu public works, but it's sort of true. You need, you need, and often that's the same person, someone who loves you and is willing to speak about you and your work when you, when you die. He didn't really have that. Um, which does make him um, a fascinating person to have done the works he did, because obviously, I, I mean, a large impetus for a lot of people in terms of doing public works is, you know, if effectively the secular version of immortality. And, you know, there are many, many people who've contributed to, I mean, I live in Bath, so there are lots of people who I know of purely for their contributions to the architecture and the skyline of the city. And they made those contributions often because they really, really wanted people not to forget who they were. Um, and I think um, this is part of what makes Haswell Green such an interesting person is that he didn't, do it for his reputation or certainly if he was in any way motivated for his reputation he was extremely bad at doing that and you know, <laughs> was that in his interest he failed drastically to become famous <laughs> forever as that person and um, which I suppose comes back to this idea of what a city leader should be and why why people should um should want to take on that kind of mantle of doing good work for the public. Um, so do you think in some ways that this sort of modest um, genius of city life or of um, the character of a city, do you see Andrew Haswell Green as um, in any way an ideal of the city leader, even if you wouldn't necessarily describe him as a city leader, or do you think there's a bit more complexity to who he was and the um, record he left than that? I think there's a ton of complexity. I mean, he was, he was ahead of his time in so many ways, you know, at, at the same time, he, he went to Trinidad for a year and worked on a, um, a sugar plantation there. And however ethically conflicted he, he seemed to have been about that, he was, you know, working with people who'd only freely and perhaps only in name been released from slavery and there's there's all sorts of sort of uncomfortable elements there's the you know the fact that in the creation of central park seneca village had to be raised and and you know many people of color had were displaced and so i i certainly don't see him as a sort of a complete ideal of of you know what a modern day city leader or city planner even would would be or would do but i do think that there there was in him this sort of long-term view and sort of being ahead of his time in what we now call climate change and just thinking about the need for big green spaces and open you know we have we have a situation at the moment in new york and most other major cities around the world actually where 
you know, speaking of park benches, I discovered his story through a park bench, as I said, where public seating is just disappearing. You know, so you you sort of have these situations and where it's harder and harder actually to find a place to sit down for free and soak up the city in New York. Um, there are more and more opportunities for paid seating outside, you know, where if you're the privileged few and you can afford to buy your overpriced latte and leave a tip, then sure you can you can sit. But um San Francisco sort of used the pandemic partly as as a justification uh, for tearing most of its public seating out of public squares and public spaces and parks. And I think most people would, a lot of people would say that the, the real motivation was that for that was cleaning up the city by which, you know, they mean putting homeless people out of sight and that becomes a huge excuse for uh, for not actually dealing with the issues that cause something like homelessness it, itself. So um, I'm rambling a bit, but I, I think you know he was he was ahead of his time in some ways. And when you think about what city planning has become now, and the advent of hostile architecture and the 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 sort of unfriendliness of a lot of public spaces, I, I you know I think he would he would definitely turn in his grave over over that and a few other things. Thank you so much, Jonathan. This has been um, a fascinating chat and a real privilege to hear you talk about The Great Mistake. Um, I was going to call it um, the most romantic novel I've ever read about city planning, but that sounds, um, like inappropriately, that. <laughs> sounds inappropriately shady. So I will say instead it is the most city planning focused romantic novel that I have ever read because, you know, I think it is an extremely lyrical beautiful and um you know one of my favorite novels of this year and thank you so much for writing it and thank you for talking to us about it thanks so much sarah